Well, good evening. Before I open in prayer and before even yeah, start the flow of this message, I just want to read the scripture. I read it during pre-service prayer. It just kind of came under my heart, connected to the theme, the theme of the message. But also, I loved how during worship tonight, a lot of the songs were just singing about who God is, his, his name, different names of God, and just different attributes of God. And um, it just reminded me also of this scripture from Isaiah chapter 9, which is a very fitting scripture for this time of year when we take extra time to reflect on the birth of Christ. But Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. I want to say amen to that. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Amen. And I really have been praying as I was during pre-service prayer, I was praying that God will show himself tonight specifically as everlasting father. It's really interesting how in the Old Testament, we only had glimmers and glimpses of this concept of God being a father. But then when you get to the New Testament, you see more and more Jesus unfolding this revelation about the fatherhood of God. And so um, that's going to be kind of where we're going to be going. Let's just pray. Let's pray for just a minute or two. Let's prepare our hearts to receive what God has for us. Father, we do come to you as our Father, the way Jesus taught us to pray. We say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And God, it's by the blood of Jesus that we come to you, that we can approach you. And we know that it's through the blood of Jesus that we are brought near to you, that we can call you our Father. We thank you for that, God. God, I ask for the Holy Spirit, God, to move through this time, through this message. Father, to make this message alive to us, to make this message tangible to us. God, to use it in a way that it transforms us, to use it in a way that it um, impacts our hearts and renews our mind, God. Would you use this time, God? Would you meet with us tonight as the everlasting Father? Would you reveal yourself to us, God? So we just set our hearts and our eyes upon you. We open our hearts to receive, God, what you want to do in this time and through this message and even in the response, God, would you heal? Would you restore? Would you draw us to yourself tonight in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, open up to John chapter 14. It might take me a couple minutes to get there, but we will get to uh, John chapter 14. There's, you know, for several weeks, even maybe a couple months, uh, there's been something kind of brewing in me, you know, when it comes to preaching messages, it's, sometimes it's hard to know when to speak certain messages. I mean, I probably have a list of 15 or 20 that are stirring, and then um, it's hard, sometimes hard to know when to release one, but I really, really sense that it was, it was the right timing this month to release a message on knowing God as Father, and, you know, one of the things I was contemplating about this, even before we get to John 14 and dive more into the meat of this, was just I was I was contemplating the multifaceted nature of the gospel and how sometimes we only emphasize a certain part of the gospel or a certain aspect of the gospel. In Hebrews it talks about how you know we should not neglect so great a salvation. Like how much more if we neglect so great a salvation like our salvation is great. Like our salvation is amazing. And sometimes it's just the basics of the gospel that we need to hear again. Because the gospel is not just for unbelievers. The gospel is for believers. Like we need to be reminded. We need to understand like what God did for us. The good news of Jesus and what he did for us. It's not just for evangelism. It's not just for bringing the lost to come back to Christ or to, you know, come to know him. But we as believers, we need to know the gospel. And sometimes we've emphasized more about what we're saved from than what we're saved into. 
Now, I don't want to neglect the importance of what we're saved from. Like, it's huge. Even that, unfortunately, has gotten minimized. Like, what we're saved from often has gotten squeezed down and made, made much more narrow than it was meant to be. I remember years, I don't know how many years ago, it might have been 10 years ago or something like that, there was, some, there was a Christian comedian and um, he would do these things, and I only saw little clips of it, but he would do these, um, as part of his comedy routine as a Christian comedian, he would talk about people who he called oversaved. He would give like, all these examples, you know, you know, like a person who's oversaved. And, you know, he would, it was cute and kind of funny at times, but like, like a person, like, you know, they're going to pray for their meal, and they might go into 20 minutes of, like, intercession, you know, for the nations or something like that. And so he would say, well, that's like, Person's oversaved, right? And so it was, it was kind of funny, but as I thought about it, you know, what, you know what hit me? I don't think most of the church has a problem being oversaved. I think most of the church has a problem being undersaved. Like, how saved are we? How saved are we? Like, do we know, like, what we've been saved from? Like, so much of the emphasis is just on, like, forgiveness. Like, you're saved from the penalty of your sin. Like, you're saved from like, the consequences of sin. Like, you're saved from hell. Now, that's super important. Like, that's really big. But it's so much more than that. And something that often gets neglected is the other side of the coin of sin, where we're saved from the power of sin. Like, we're, like we're, it's not just we're saved from the penalty of sin. It's we're also supposed to be saved from the power of sin. Like, did you know that sin is not supposed to reign in your life anymore once you're a believer? Like sin is not supposed to be that like a controlling factor that keeps you in bondage and enslavement. That doesn't mean that as a believer you're never going to stumble or you're never going to sin again, but it should be a difference. It should be a difference in our lives. And so I wonder how much of the church in the nation of America is actually undersaved. I'm actually concerned that many people that attend church across this nation have actually never been born again. Like, actually have never really repented of their sin and been transformed. Like, if you, if, if you just prayed a prayer one day, but nothing changed in your life, that's not the fruit of salvation that the Bible talks about. So... If the gospel didn't change your life, then how, how, how would it change your eternity? So we're saved, like we're, we're saved from the penalty of sin. We're saved from the power of sin. We're saved from the, uh, from the dominion of darkness. We're saved from demonic spirits and unclean spirits, demonic oppression. We're saved from the curse, Galatians 3. We're redeemed from the curse of like all these things we're saved from. It's amazing. But then there's this whole other side. Do you know that we're also saved for something? We're saved into something. Like you're saved. Paul talked about this in Ephesians when he was talking about how it's not by our works that we're saved. He said we're saved not by works but by grace through faith that, that no one should boast. But he said then right after that, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time that we would walk in them. So do you know that you're actually saved for a purpose? Like that's why when you got saved, God didn't just translate you to heaven. Did you ever notice that? Like, he actually has stuff for us to do. He has a purpose for us. There's a calling for us to walk in. There's something unique about the way he gifted you and called you. So we're saved for a purpose. We're saved, but we're also saved for relationship. And we're saved into sonship. Now, when I say sonship, I'm talking about men and women. That's sons and daughters. It's an overarching word. So we're saved into an identity as sons and daughters. We're actually saved into that. And that means we actually know God as our Father. We know God as our Father. John chapter 14, Jesus unpacks this revelation a little bit here with his disciples as they're preparing for him, he, or he was preparing them for when he was going to go to the cross and he was going to be going away for a while. And he was preparing them that he was going to send the Holy Spirit. But right here in chapter 14, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. 
That word is actually literally dwellings. It doesn't necessarily mean mansion. It's like dwellings, dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? That sounds like a reasonable question. How can we know the way? We don't even know what you're talking about and where you're going. I love this response by Jesus. And this is a well-known passage, but I think sometimes we fall short of its meaning. Jesus said to him, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The word that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. There's a couple of things I want to draw out of this, right? So they're having this conversation, and again, Jesus is preparing them. He's basically saying, like, I'm going to be, I'm going, to be going, but don't worry. Like, I'm, I'm going to be preparing a place for you. In my Father's house, there's many rooms, there's many dwellings. I'm going to go actually prepare a place for you. And it's actually, there's a lot of symbolism in this that relates to, like, the Jewish marriage custom and all that that I'm not going to get into because it was customary for a groom to go away to prepare a, a, a place for the, for the bride. And then the, then the groom would come at the, you know, on a day when the bride wouldn't even necessarily know the exact day. So there's a lot of like symbolism there, um, but, but this, again, that's beyond the scope of this message. Um, but he's talking about how he's going to be, he's gonna be uh, dying on the cross, being raised from the dead, ascending, and he's going to be preparing a place. And then this question, Thomas is like, Lord, what are you talking about? Like, we don't know where you're going, or this is too like cryptic or symbolic. Like, help us understand this. And then Jesus makes the statement that I want to really zone in on in verse 6. He said, Philip, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Very often times, I've heard it, this verse used to describe how Jesus is the only way to heaven. That's often how I hear people use this verse. And I'm not denying that that is true. Jesus, he, Jesus is the cross, the death of Jesus, his uh, blood shed for us. Like it, that, is, that is the only way for us to be forgiven of our sins and to come into eternal life. But I also want you to see something about that verse. That's not what Jesus said in the verse. So that is a true statement, but that's not what he actually said in that verse necessarily. He said, I am the way. Nobody comes to... Somebody say it. The Father. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. You can summarize it by saying it like this. Jesus is the way, the Father is the destination. Jesus is the pathway. He is how you get there. And in, in other words, Jesus is actually saying, he's actually saying, I'm not the stopping point. Now, again, we, there's the mystery of the Trinity. If you ask the Father, you know, what's, what's, who's, what's, what's the most important thing? Well, Jesus. If you, ask the, if you ask the Son, who's most important? The Father. If you ask the Holy Spirit, he'd say, the Father and the Son. <laughs> He points to both of them, right? And so again, there's this mystery of the Trinity, one God in three persons. But Jesus is basically saying, I'm not the stopping point. I'm actually meant to lead you somewhere else. And if you come to me, but don't continue on to know the Father, you've actually fallen short of why I even came. 
You've actually missed some of the purpose for why I came to this earth. I am the way. The Father, though, is the destination. Whenever I think about this concept or talk about it, I like to think of when I go to my parents' house, because my parents live in Pittsburgh. That's where I grew up. And my parents still live in the Pittsburgh area. And so whenever my family and I, whenever we drive to Pittsburgh, we take the Pennsylvania Turnpike. How many people have ever driven on the Turnpike? It's gotten more expensive since I started driving it, I don't know, a while back. But, but we drive, like, the majority of the drive to Pittsburgh is on the PA Turnpike. And so think of it this way. Like, the Turnpike is the way it's the way I'm going. It's the path I'm driving on. It's the road I'm driving on. But it's not the stopping point. It's actually to lead me to a destination. Like, it's supposed to lead me to my father's house. It's supposed to take me to where I can actually meet with my father. I can actually see him. I can actually hug him. I can actually talk to him. Like, that's the purpose of me getting on that turnpike the turnpike is not the end. The turnpike is not where I stop. The turnpike is not the purpose. The turnpike is actually meant to lead me somewhere else. And if I just stayed on the turnpike and I never got into the driveway and never went into the door and never actually talked to my dad, I would, I would, I would miss something. So it's not about putting the father against the son, the son against the father. Like they're, they're, they're one. I mean, they're, they're in unity. But sometimes we, we stop short of what God wants. Jesus is the way. The father is the destination. And as Jesus continued on here, then Philip said, all right, Lord, show us the father. And that is enough for us. Show us the Father, and that's, that's sufficient for us. That's a, man, that's a powerful statement. Like, I don't know if Philip knew what he was saying or what, what exactly, but I think that's so true. Like, show us the Father. Like, that's, that's it. Like, that's what we need. That, that will be enough. Do you know how many things will be settled when we know God as Father? Do you know how... Do you know how many things will be settled in our life when we get this revelation? When, when like Philip said, show us the Father, it'll be, that'll be enough for us. That will, that will be sufficient. That will meet so many other needs when we actually have a revelation of God as the Father in our lives personally. Of course, I think all of us can understand it intellectually. We can all agree that in the Bible it says that God is Father, but I don't mean just having an intellectual, I mean, I mean show us, reveal to us, give us insight, give us revelation by the Holy Spirit so that we know it deep in our heart, so that we're rooted in it and grounded in it, not just that we can agree with it as an intellectual concept, but that we can actually know it and be secure in the reality that God is my Father. And that's one of the main reasons Jesus came to the earth. There's multiple reasons. I mean, he's, he came as the Messiah. He came to be the sacrifice for our sins as the Lamb of God. We sang about him as the Lamb, right? There's, it's multifaceted. But he, he gives us another reason right here. When Philip asked the question, Jesus is like, well, what do you mean, Philip? Haven't, you, haven't we been interacting for these last three years? Th this is such a powerful statement. He who has seen me has seen me. The Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Sometimes I think we get this picture because of the fact that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He is an intercessor, all that for us. Sometimes we get this picture that like God the Father is like the angry one and Jesus is like the merciful one. And so, you know, we can relate to Jesus better, um, but then we, we don't want to relate to God like the creator or the father because it's like he's like the mad one, but Jesus appeases him. And so then, so then we're okay. Like, but that's not what Jesus said. That's not what the Bible teaches. 
know what the Bible teaches? It says that Jesus is the exact representation of the nature of God. The most perfect revelation of who God is is found in the person of Jesus Christ. It says he is the exact representation of, of, of the Godhead. So if you ever want to know what God the Father is like, the best thing you can do is study the life of Jesus. Because what did Jesus say? When you've seen me, you've actually, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. He dwells in me. I only do what I hear the Father saying. All that, all that. And sometimes, again, we can struggle with the multifaceted nature of God because we sometimes think like, well, one will cancel out the other. Like, God is love. That doesn't cancel out like God is holy. Or God is merciful. Doesn't cancel out that God is just. God is good. Doesn't cancel out the fact that God is all-powerful or sovereign. Like, you know, we read, I read from Isaiah 9 where he lists these attributes. Like, the same one who's called Counselor is also called Mighty God. He's also called Prince of Peace. He's also called Everlasting Father. Like, it's, he's the same God. And so, sometimes we disconnect these things and, like, we either embrace, like, this concept of God that's, like, the angry God or we embrace this, like, like lovey-dovey, like humanistic love God? You know, where it's like, it's a twisting of God's love, right? Well, no, God, God wants us to know him in his fullness. But I don't know that we fully grasp the significance of this idea of God being our father. Like, wow. Like, I'm praying like Philip prayed, show me the Father. Like, I, I want to understand what this means. Like, if I, if I, do I really believe that? Like, do I really believe that God is my Father? Do I worry about money? I wonder if I know God as my Father. Because when I was growing up, I never gave one thought to how much money was in our bank account. Even though there was, in my early childhood, we were, we were very poor for several years, I, I would have never known it. All I knew was that I had food to eat every day. All I knew is that my parents were going to protect me. They were going to provide for me. They were going to love me. I never worried about money because my dad, he was going to take care of me. Do we believe God is our father? Like, do we, do we believe that only when our bank account's really full, when we have a really good job? What if we lose that job? Then is God still our provider? Like, who, like, do we know God as Father? Like, when Jesus taught about God being Father, he, he, he said stuff like this. In Matthew 6, he's talking about seeking first the kingdom, and, and he said, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what, what you're going to wear, what clothes you're going to put on. Don't, don't worry about Now, he, he knows we need those. He's, he's not saying that you don't need those things. But why did he say that? He said, how much more? He said, look at how God takes care of the birds. And he says, don't you think your father in heaven also cares about how much more? He said, does your father in heaven, will he care for you? Will he provide for you? See, what if, what if knowing God as father actually solves a problem of worry? What if knowing God as Father actually solves some of our insecurities, some of our fears? Knowing it in a deeper way, knowing it in a, it's a process, it's a journey for all of us. 
of growing in this understanding beyond an intellectual agreement into a heart level, deeply rooted place where we, we know that we know that God is our Father. Now think about who God is for a second. And then remember that he's your father. Think about who God is. The eternal God. The creator who spoke everything into existence. The one who's called the great I am. The one who is sovereign. The one who is all powerful. The one who is all knowing. The one who never was created because he existed for all eternity. That's the one who the Bible says is your father. It says he owns the cattle on a thousand hill. Like if you were growing up and your dad was a billionaire, would you worry about money? He owns everything. That doesn't mean life is always easy. That doesn't mean our bank account's always full to overflowing. But who is our source? Who is our provider? Who is our Father? Show us the Father. I looked up last, I think it was last, yeah, sometime last year, maybe a year, year, maybe a year and a half or more ago, I was digging into the word father in the Greek language. And when I looked it up on um, one of my soft, software programs that unpacks some original language, it, it gave three words that the word father kind of relates to. And it was nourisher, protector, upholder. I was like, wow, that is amazing. Nourisher, like the word father means, means the one, one who gives life. One who like, but it's not just one who gives life though, it's also one who nourishes life. And then it said a protector. And then it says a upholder who holds up and who keeps from whatever it might be trying to pull down or, or sway or whatever. There's a, there's a, a place of lifting up, of strengthening, of nourishing. Nourishment, what does that do? Nourishment gives you what you need to be sustained. I think one of the, I put some words down here for when we have a good relationship with God the Father, when we know him well as the Father, there's a sense of security a sense of stability, a sense of strengthening, a sense of strength. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he was praying for the Ephesians, he was praying for them. And one of the things he prayed for them, he said that you may be rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded. He used words that are foundational. Being rooted, think of a tree that has roots under the ground that's what's sustaining it. That's what's making it stable. That's what's making it secure. That's what's nourishing it, is the root system. Think about when you're gro grounded is the foundation. It's, what's, it's what everything else is built upon. So it's, it's foundational. And so when there is a revelation of God the Father, it's going to bring those attributes into your life. You're going to be more secure in who you are. As a son, as a daughter of God, that brings a place of security. So often we're trying to find our identity and our, and our security in all these other places, all these other things outside of relationship with God. And that's what keeps us on unstable ground because those things were never meant to be the foundation of our identity. Even good and legitimate things. Now, sometimes we can veer off into sin and other stuff like that. But sometimes it's even good, good things that can become a, a foundation of our identity that was never meant to be. And that could be our, our calling in life even. 
or your, your schooling or your workplace or even your family or uh, your, your ministry, like whatever it is, your gifting, your, all those things. I remember having this realization a while back, I can't remember how long ago, but realizing, wow, if I found my identity as a preacher, like I would be in trouble. Like I would be in trouble. Like what if I had a bad sermon one day? You guys have seen those before. <laughs> what if... <laughs> trying to be careful what I say. What if I get that email the next day after my sermon? <laughs> I've had some of those. Then what? Oh no, like what if, what if my whole life is wrapped up in like, I'm a preacher, I'm a minister, I'm a teacher. What if all of a sudden I'm on sabbatical for six weeks and I'm not preaching every week or I'm not going, going to speak places? Then, then who am I? Who am I then? Those things are never meant to be what we're rooted in. Never meant to be what we're grounded in. That's not what Paul said. He said, be rooted and grounded in love. God's love for us is the only secure foundation for us to build our lives on. And if we deviate from that and we get our roots in other things, other places, other relationships, whatever it might be, even good things, we're not going to be stable because then when those things get shaken or when something bad happens with that, because the truth is, I'm always a son. I'm always a son. Whether I preach today or I don't preach today, I'm a son. Whether I sell a book or don't sell a book, like whatever it is. Whether your job's going good or your job's not going good. Whether you're called to this or you're called to that. Whether you have a great day or you have a bad day. Whether you you know, move in an excellent way one day or maybe one day you don't do so excellent. Like, you're still a daughter. You're still a son. That has to be the foundation. That's where God wants to take us. That's where God wants us to be. Where we are grounded, rooted, founded in that place. I think there's some things that can hinder us from actually coming to that place and knowing God in that way and having that revelation of, of the Father in a greater way. I think there's some things that can, can be a barrier or a hindrance. And one of those, I have two of them that I just jotted down. One of those is a bad experience with our earthly father. can create a lens that we see things through and we see God through. A lens is what you see through. So if I put on a pair of blue glasses, I would think everything's blue, even if it's not blue. These flowers are not blue. These ones are white. If I had blue glasses on, guess what they would look like? They would look blue. You would look blue. Not because you're blue, but because there's a lens over my eyes that is shaping how I see the world, how I see a person, how I see... We, we can have a lens. And, you know, God designed life to happen in the context of family. God designed life to happen... He designed parents and mothers and fathers to have children and then to raise up. And so our view of God is so shaped, whether we know it or not, whether we realize it or not, much of the way we relate to God is connected to the way we related to our parents. See, one of the reasons why Jesus came to show us the Father is because he wanted us to have a clear picture of what he was like. 
Because even though all, all scriptures God breathed, everything, we get to know God when we read through the, the whole Bible and we ask for revelation of who God is, his nature and his characters all throughout the Bible. But even under the old covenant, they, they couldn't know him that way, that close. It was easy to misrepresent what he was and who he was. And so Jesus came in a human form to give us a tangible expression the word who became flesh, tangible expression as to what God was like. And so in the same way that Jesus came as a human to represent God, sometimes the negative of that can happen. So it might be hard to relate to God as father if you never had a father. Or you had a father, but he didn't represent God the Father well. And there's only one perfect father. That's the one in heaven. So we've all had different experiences. We've all had... There's a spectrum, right? I mean... Some of us have had really amazing you know, experiences with our parents and our earthly father. And there's a whole spectrum all the way down to like, you know, horrific abuse and abandonment and, uh, you know, just awful stuff. I mean, just awful stuff. And then everything in between. We're all somewhere in that spectrum. I mean, I've been blessed that, that I grew up with a father that represented God well. The longer I've lived, the more I realize what a blessing that has been. But I'm also really aware of the fact that many of us, even in this room, have not maybe had an experience on this side of the spectrum. Maybe it's been closer to the middle, or maybe it's even on the far end, or maybe there wasn't a, a dad who was present, or maybe he was, but there was such confusion, and there was abuse that happened, and abandoned the family, there's all kind, of, all kind of stuff. So if that's your experience, then sometimes even the concept of God as Father, you don't, sometimes you don't even want to relate to him that way. You'd rather just talk about Jesus. Because Father has a bad, a negative connotation to it. But I want you to know something, that even if that is your experience, that is not where God wants you to stay. That is not where God wants you to stay. We're not meant to say, well, I'm just going to talk to Jesus. I'm just going to know Jesus, but I just, I don't want to really understand the Father thing. It's just, it's too painful. It's, and it might be painful, but God wants to heal. It might be painful, but when we open up our hearts to God to come into those areas, then he can actually begin to heal and he can actually begin to restore. And then roots that we've placed in all these other places, then can we start to be, one by one, can be taken out and they can be put right in the Father's love, right in the heart of God. And your life starts to become more stable. Your life starts to become more secure. You start to become more nourished. You start to become more and more who God called you to be in every environment. No matter what's going on around you, you can be rooted. You can be established. It solves so much. So if we've, if we've had a bad experience with an earthly father, even maybe father figure or others who might maybe misrepresenting God, that, that can have a a negative effect that can have an impact on us that can keep us from actually knowing God as Father. And then the second one, and they sometimes they go together depending on what the upbringing was like, but this might also be due to a, maybe church experience. But the second one is a legalistic approach to God or a legalistic mindset about who God is. A legalistic approach to God. What I mean by that is Relating to God on the basis of performance. 
that in order for God to love me, I have to be really, 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 really good. In order for God to care for me, provide for me, forgive my sins. Like I I really have to be this, I have to be so good to earn it. But I want you to understand that that's actually not the gospel that we believe. Nobody is going to be loved by God or make it to heaven or go eternal life because they were good enough to be there. Nobody. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All is a pretty big word. So what we couldn't do for ourselves, he came to do for us. But if we, if we were raised in a household environment or a church environment, it was super legalistic and everything was about just legalism and just the way that you earn your place with God is you have to follow these thousand you know, ways and these thousand rules. And, um, and that's, how, that's how you win God's heart. That's how you win God's favor. Even if it wasn't taught, if it was the culture, the environment, by what was said, by what was not said, by how you measured up or didn't measure up. See, a lot of people grew up under an impossible standard, which is called perfectionism. And this is, a, this is for us as parents, those of us in the room that are parents, like we get to change that. I want you, those who are parents in the room, I want you to really contemplate this and how we are representing God to our children. Do we have an impossible standard? If there's an impossible standard, then there's lots of criticism. There's a sense from the, from the kids that no matter what I do, it's just, I, I, it's never good enough. So parents, think about this. If, you're, if, if, if one of your children does something, they paint a picture, they write a poem, they're expressing themselves, they're on a, on a sports team, How you treat your children, not just when they do well, but when they mess up, is going to communicate their view of God. So when your child you know, gives a speech and they fumble through some of their words and they trip up and they mess up, and the first thing you say to them when they, when, when they see you is, how could you, how could, that was terrible, how could you mess up like that? Or when they show you their little painting that they did in school that day, or and you start nitpicking, oh yeah, but this you should have done. You, why'd you do this? Why'd you? What, what, what's that? Do you realize 
the res- like how much we impact our children in these things. Like I remember last year, I think maybe a year ago, when my son played drums for the first time on the worship band. He played one song. I think it was last year. Tyler, was it last year? Maybe two years ago. I can't remember. He he'd been practicing. He'd been taking some lessons, and uh, he'd been practicing, you know, for months. And just you know, I think there was what was the song he did? Um, Happy day, happy day. That's a great drum song. He was, I mean, Chad Marriott was giving him lessons, and he was, like, practicing at home. And, and then finally, it was, like, his, his debut, you know, on the, on the drum set up there. And so, I think, was it the first? I think it was the first song. Yeah, it was the first song in the, the band. And, you know, the first thing that happened was, when he went to start, he dropped his drumstick. He dropped his drumstick. And then... He picked it up, and he was able to get, get on beat, and he was able to do, you know, a great, a great job, and it was, it was awesome. So what would have happened if the first thing I say to him after he comes off that is, how could you drop the drumstick like that? Man, you, you, you blew it. Like, you just, do you know that that's what some people grow up with? about just deflating just and here's it here's what I'm not saying I'm not saying that being representing the father means that we don't ever correct and we don't ever point out mistakes no of course that's actually part of being a father that's part of what God the father does that's actually one of the proofs of being his children is that he corrects us that's actually Hebrews says that's actually one of the proofs he corrects, he disciplines those he loves. Like, I can't discipline a child who doesn't belong to me. I can be in a restaurant and there could be kids next to me throwing food everywhere. It's, I have no authority. I can't, I can't pull them aside and give them a conversation or whatever. Like, why? Because they're not my children. If they're my children, then I can correct them. So what I'm not saying is that, well, we just have to never say anything negative or never correct. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the heart posture of it. I'm saying, are we, is there this impossible standard that we're training our children under that no matter what they do, it's always just, just never good enough. Because you know what that does in a child? It puts inside of them a mindset that says, what's the point? What's the point? Why should I try? And some of us have that mindset or that way with God. It's like, well, what's the point? Like, what's the point of even trying to pursue God or trying to grow in my relationship and trying to, you know, have my quiet time? Because I just, it's never good enough. It's just, it's, you know, I try and then, and then I, you know, I miss a day of my t- prayer time and then I, I feel condemned and I feel like, you know, it's, it's, Right? It's, but it, maybe it's because there's been a legalistic mindset and approach to God that can keep us from actually dwelling with him and knowing him as father. We can see this played out so well in the story of the prodigal son, which that's what it's often known as in Luke 15. We, you know, we, we call it the story of the prodigal son. What if it was actually called the story, the parable of the loving father? Because that's the purpose of that story is to show us the Father. To show us the Father's heart. And I'm not going to, for time's sake, I'm not going to read through it all. And if you want to dig into it later this week, it's in Luke 15, I think starting at verse 10 or 11. It's a, a long parable. But in the parable, there's a father that has two sons, a younger and an older. And we always focus on the younger one. He's the one that squanders the wealth. He asks for the inheritance. He, he receives the inheritance. Then he takes it. And then he goes and he goes off to a faraway place. And he just 
parties it up and just goes into wild living and sinful living and, and he, he starts wasting the money and all this and then he ends up with nothing and there's a famine. Right? We, that's the part that we always emphasize and then finally he comes to his senses. He's a beautiful picture of repentance, by the way. That story is one of the best illustrations of what repentance looks like for that younger son. And then, but when he comes home, we, 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 we see the father's heart. We see the father running toward him. We see right when he's turning, right when he's on his way, right? He's changed his heart and mind. He's come to true repentance. And so he's turning and he's walking that path. And the father comes and he begins to embrace him. You see, that's the father's heart. Salvation, again, it's multifaceted. Yes, you go from you know, unforgiven to forgiven or lost to saved. You go from being dead to being alive. But you know what also it is? It is a reconciliation, that's what Paul calls our salvation to the Corinthians. He calls it, he says, be reconciled to God. It's, it's, it's being reconciled to your father after being away from his house. And, and, and so it shows us the heart of God, the heart of God as a father when the son comes home, when he runs out to embrace him. But then we see something else with the older brother then. Because the older brother's in the field working. And when he hears the music and he hears the dancing and he says, what's going on here? Why is there all this partying and celebrating? And, and he finds out it's because the younger brother came home. Is he happy? He's not happy. You know what he says? Paraphrasing, but he says, dad, what are you doing? I've been serving you all these years. You never threw me a party. And you know what the father said? He called him son. He said, son, you are always with me, and all I have is yours. Don't you know the father? Don't you know that you're my son? Don't you know that you have access to my whole house? You see, you only knew my field, but you never knew the house. See, the, older, see the, younger, the younger son went into lawlessness, went into sinful living, went into... See, that's one of the things that can, that can disconnect us from the father's house is going into sinful living and rebellion and going into darkness and, and just it, it, it disconnects us from that relationship. It puts us away. But then, but then the one that was still there, the older, the older one had the legalistic mindset. He only knew the father in a legalistic way. And so he didn't actually have that relationship with the Father. He didn't actually have the fellowship with the Father. He was well-versed in the Father's field. But he wasn't acquainted with the Father's house. You see, the younger, the younger brother, he had a good revelation of sonship but not servanthood. He knew how to be a son. How do I know? Because he could ask and he could receive. He knew how to be a son. He knew how to access the father's inheritance. He knew how to receive that father's blessing and that father's, right? And maybe it wasn't a bad thing that he got the inheritance. Maybe he wasn't doing anything wrong by asking for it. Maybe it was just once he got it, he realized, wow, look at everything I have. What could I do with this? I don't need my father anymore. I can go out on my own. I, could, I don't have to live under his roof anymore. He, he can't tell me what to do. Or he, can. he knew sonship, but then he used what he received not as a servant. And so when you have a sonship mentality, but you don't know how to be a servant, then you become spoiled. See, the older brother had the opposite problem. He knew how to be a servant. He didn't know how to be a son. And so when you know how to be a servant, but you don't know how to be a son, then you take on a slave mentality. You take on a mentality of, I'm only here to work. I'm only here to do things. 
I'm only here to accomplish something. If I don't accomplish something, then I must not be worth anything. If I don't get something done, I must not be loved by the Father. If I, if I can't get, be, produce something, if I can't make something happen, if I can't do this or that, then, then all my worth is wrapped up in that. All my love is wrapped up in that. And see, that's not how we're intended to live. And Jesus showed us what it was like to be a son and a servant at the same time. And he was not working for the Father's love. He was working from the Father's love. And that's the place that we want to be. Not like the younger one who takes it and squanders it. Not like the older one who doesn't even know how to receive it. But like Jesus, the son, he's the pattern for us who was a son and a servant at the same time, who is secure in that place of the Father's voice over him. And so therefore, when he received from the Father, he didn't use it for himself. He didn't squander it. He didn't go into sinful living. Receiving the love of God should never cause us to go into sin. Do you know that? Do you know what it should cause us to do? It should cause us to love him more. We love him because he first loved us. Any revelation of the love of God that will drive a person into sin, there's something missing. There's something lacking. But a revelation of his love that makes you secure, that makes you want to love him more, want to obey him more, that's what we're talking about. That's what we need. I want to have, um, I'm not sure if somebody on the keyboard, so I don't know if it's going to be Danielle or Tyler there's a couple of scriptures I want to just kind of bring this to a close. We're going to have a response. We're going to have some time of ministry. I was drawn to a couple of passages. This concept of sonship, of being children of God, it's all throughout the Bible, especially throughout the New Testament. And I was drawn to a couple of places that Paul talked about it. You can find it in 1 John. You can find I mean, it's such a vast concept. Romans 8, 15, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you know what some of us need? We need the Holy Spirit to bear witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Some of us don't need another person to tell you that you're a child of God. Some, we can hear it all day. We need the Holy Spirit to give us a revelation of it. We don't necessarily need another teaching about it. We don't necessarily need another book about it. We need, we need the Holy Spirit to show us and tell us and bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If you have been born again, you are a child of God. If you have given your life to the Lord Jesus, you've repented and given, you are a child of God. That changes everything. That literally changes everything. Derek Prince told this story, I think it's in his book, Husbands and Fathers, and I can't remember all the details because I wasn't thinking about it until two seconds ago. So I didn't have a chance to actually look it up. But I remember him telling this story about somebody who was, I can't remember if they were in a different country or they, they were lost somewhere. They were lost. They didn't know where they were. I'm not sure if it was in a dangerous place or just a, you know, big, big city where they were in a different, I can't remember what the details were. But he, he said the person, all they did was just say, Father, Father, Father. That's all they could do is just call to God as Father. But let me tell you something, that was all they needed. That was all they needed. For some of us, we've gotten too complicated. And you know what we need? Show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. Because when God is your Father, you are never alone. Because when God is your Father, you will always have enough. You will always have what you need. When God is your Father, you will have an identity. 
You won't have to try to be somebody else. You won't have to compare to this person or that, this gift, that gift. You won't have to do it because God is your Father. You will be secure. We need the Holy Spirit to bear witness. He himself bears witness. You receive the spirit of adoption. Do you know that? I find this amazing. That we are children of God, both by being born again by his word and spirit, but also by adoption. Like God encompasses both of those. Like his seed lives in us, his word comes in us, his spirit makes us to be born again and make us a new creation. But then he also covers adoption as well. The spirit himself bears witness. We are children of God. The spirit of adoption. That's Romans 8. And then I was also drawn to Galatians chapter 6. Sorry, chapter 4, verse 6. And this is where Paul, he's addressing legalism. He's addressing the concept of legalism all throughout the whole book of Galatians. But chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Stand to your feet. Would you stand to your feet here? 1 John chapter 3. Verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, meaning in eternity, what what it's going to look like. We know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So does the love of God lead to lawlessness? No. It actually progresses into purity because we're going to see him We're going to see him as he is. And so we have this hope. And so we purify ourselves because we know he is pure. I'm just going to begin to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to just move through this place. We're going to have some response time and don't know fully what it's going to look like. But I believe God wants to touch people and minister to people. Father, I thank you for this time. And I thank you, God, for the power of your word, God. And God, I recognize, Lord, that without your Holy Spirit, God, we have nothing. God, we don't just need to hear this message, God. We need your Holy Spirit to bring it home in our hearts. We need the Holy Spirit to bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We need what it says in Romans 5, 5. The love of God is poured out into your hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so I ask right now, Father, in the name of Jesus... Show us the Father. God, we agree with what Philip said. Show us the Father, and that will be enough. Show us the Father, and that will heal our heart. Show us the Father, and that will make us secure. Show us the Father. ask, Father, by the Holy Spirit, God, that you would begin to just minister to hearts in this place. You would begin to, God, even put your finger on those parts that there might be pain, not because you want to cause pain, but because you want to heal pain.
I want to just feel like I'm supposed to open up this altar for anyone that just needs to respond. That just says, I want to, I need to know the Father. I don't necessarily want you to come just, just to come, but if you really sensed God was actually speaking to you through the message or that you, you just know you need to receive something from God tonight from this, you know you need the Holy Spirit to give you that deeper revelation in your heart and bear witness with your spirit. And if you just sense that there's some way you need to respond and receive, I just want to open up the altar and just invite, invite you to come to the front just as a step of faith. Just as a step to say, I'm responding and I want to receive this revelation in a greater way. Thank you, God. Father, I ask you to move by your Holy Spirit, God, even for those that came to this front, God, for those across this room, God, I ask you to bring, Lord, the revelation that is needed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Who else? Who else needs to come to the front just as a step of faith as a step of response because you know the Holy Spirit's been speaking or ministering. Thank you, God. One of the things that I want to happen here in the room tonight for those that it applies to is there might need to be forgiveness tonight towards a parent, towards an earthly father. And so as we have this part of this response time, if that's part of what you know that you need to, that step tonight, just take some time right now and just begin to verbalize it. I'm not going to kind of lead a repeat prayer for this time, but just in your own words, just take a moment and just begin to express forgiveness. Begin to just say, God, I, I forgive my dad for this or for that or what he did or what he didn't do. In that same portion of scripture, John 14, 15, 16, one of the things that Jesus told his disciples, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm gonna pray that God would just break off any orphan mindset, any orphan spirit, any way that you've been living like an orphan. An orphan is fatherless. An orphan is not secure, not stable. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I ask God that you would just minister. Father, for those in this place or those that are watching, Lord, that have been under that mindset, God, that orphan mindset, God, that orphan mentality, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray a breaking it now. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of every orphan spirit. I command it to go. In the name of Jesus, I command it to be lifted off, to be released, Father, from their mindsets, God. Would you just 
cleanse the eyes, God, of any lens that we're seeing you through, God, that is not of you. I also believe God wants to set people free in this room from perfectionism that have lived under the standard that was always impossible to live up to and measure up to. So it caused you to always feel like you're, you have to earn, you have to earn, you have to, your, your, your identity is found in being good enough and earning and being perfect. And so Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to come in this place. Father, to break the power of perfectionism in the name of Jesus. I break, I break the yoke of perfectionism right now in the name of Jesus. I break it from your people in this place. I command it to lift off, to go in Jesus' name. I command every uh, generational mindset that was passed down of perfectionism, that spirit I command to go out to leave in Jesus' name. Perfectionism I command to be broken. I ask that your anointing would break the yoke over, lift off the heavy burden of perfectionism break it off, would release, would release them from it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Show us the Father. Jesus, would you show us what you're like so when we see you, we see the Father.